Oh my god, they're dead! Who could have done such a heinous act? I bet it was that frog down by the swamp. I don't like that frog. He's got them shifty eyes. It was that convict iron jaw, that rapscallion. I bet it was that strange shadowy figure that likes to swing in the park on Thursday nights. I swear to you, it was my stuffed panda. He's, he's possessed. It could have been Ricky's arm. We haven't seen it since it got cut off. I definitely know who the killer is. That that way. Way. Blank is the killer. Happy New Year and welcome to Blank is the Killer, the unoriginal horror movie podcast where I watch six new-to-me horror movies with a bonus seventh horror topic at the end. I got some more seasonal movies to end the year with. I'll be back to random movies with no theme next episode. Come fall into this deep pit of movies with me. Number 1, Antisocial, 2013, directed by Cody Callahan. We start off watching a girl kill her friend during a live stream. Then a girl named Sam, who is having some relationship issues, ends up at a friend's New Year's Eve party. While her and four others are getting ready for the party to happen, the news informs them that people are becoming infected. People start trying to break into the house, and people inside are starting to become infected. It's revealed that a subliminal message, created by the movie's equivalent of Facebook, is infecting people. Sam ends up being the only person to live after completing home brain surgery to remove a tumor that the social media created. When she gets outside, the dead begin to rise all around her as she stands in the street with an axe. Social media is the killer. This movie is a ham-fisted social commentary about the dangers of this generation's addiction to social media. I knew it would be something like this going in, but I also thought it was going to be a lot more enjoyable. The movie, to no one's surprise, is bad. I mainly watched it on my journey to find a good New Year's Eve horror movie. At least I was able to scratch this off my very short list of potentials. Now even though the pacing, acting, and plot are absolutely terrible, there was a tiny bit of enjoyment to be squeezed out of this movie. There are a few parts that are unintentionally hilarious. These five people are in a house waiting for their party to start in an hour. A couple decides that this is the perfect time to make a sex tape. So a girl starts doing a sexy dance in her underwear while her boyfriend films it. They don't even close the door. We then cut away to see what's going on with the others for a good amount of time. Then we go back to the sexy dance, which is still going strong with the girl swaying back and forth. Man, that is one sexy dance I was thinking to myself. We then cut away again, only to cut back to the sexy dance that is still happening with the same side to side sway and everything. She must have been doing the sexy dance for at least 10 minutes. In another more important part of the film, which yes, I'm using important loosely, the group's friend, Chad, shows up at the door after the gang has barricaded themselves inside the house. They have a back and forth about letting him inside and ultimately decide to leave him outside since he is showing signs of being infected. Everyone is incredibly bummed out about not letting Chad in the house. One of the characters even yells, Guys, it's Chad. They keep talking about how much they love Chad and how sorry they are that they can't let Chad in. It is seriously the one scene where they try to act, and it's them crying about a dude named Chad. Without the chatters, life is sadders. That reminds me, whenever anyone is talking to someone, even if it is a one-on-one -on -one chat, they use the other person's name in almost every sentence. I guess the movie really wanted you to know those names. There are scenes with some weird tentacles. Only one of the three tentacle scenes is good, but that one scene is gross and great. A girl pulls a tentacle out of her mouth, then cuts the part off that she's pulled out. I'm honestly not sure why she cut it like that, since doing so would allow the remaining tentacle to stay inside her, if it hadn't been a hallucination. The gore in this isn't the worst. We get a lot of dark red, almost black, practical blood in parts like a bottle throat slash. One part had some really bad animated blood, but other than that instance of bad CGI, the other uses of digital blood were fine, even though digital blood is not my cup of tea. We get one scene that was almost amazing, where Sam does some at-home brain surgery on herself with a drill, but the way it was shot makes the fake head they drill into look way too stiff. 
Making it tremble a bit would have really helped sell it. I still enjoyed the scene though. Sam is easily the most boring character in the movie, even before she gives herself this partial lumbotomy to pull out a tumor. She fades into the background even when she's the only one on screen. There is a reveal that she's pregnant and the would-be father has broken up with her, so maybe her acting empty and void of any personality or normal reactions the entire time was a choice. But with what's going on around her, the pregnancy should be the least of her concerns. I'm just going to reiterate that the acting in this is abysmal. The music in this movie is awful goofy and rarely fits with what's going on. For example, we get a pre-party montage of a group of five people pre-partying with some awful dubstep music playing over the top like it's some kind of crazy rager. And in other parts, some bad stuff is happening in the basement and the music choice is best described as spooky music from a kid's cartoon. Going back to the pregnancy, Sam is continuously throwing up throughout the movie to set up a reveal that she's pregnant. Why is it so hard for movies and television to make someone throwing up believable? Put some soup in their mouth and have them feign throwing up. It's simple. 99% of vomit scenes are terrible. This movie is not worth seeing. Give it an old skip -rooney. I watched it with Kat, so I'll leave you with something she said during our viewing. I hate this Black Mirror episode. Number 2. All Through the House, 2015, directed by Todd Nunes. A person steals a Santa suit and creepy mask from Christmas decorations sitting out on a lawn. They then begin killing a bunch of people while dressed as a creepy Santa. While this is going on, a girl named Rachel has come home for Christmas. Her mom's dead. She hangs out with some friends and ends up at the creepy neighbor Mrs. Garrett's house. Mrs. G's daughter is also said to be dead. Mrs. G leaves the girls at the house, and after killing other random people, the evil Santa eventually shows up and starts murdering them. It's revealed that Rachel's mom had an affair with Mr. G, and that he is Rachel's father. Mrs. G always wanted a daughter, but got a son instead, which she tried to make a daughter through the magic of genital mutilation. The evil Santa is Mrs. G's kid, Jamie. Mr. G went to jail for the mutilation. His wife did, and Mrs. G reveals that she killed Rachel's mom. Mrs. G then attempts to kill Jamie after she has captured Rachel, whom she plans to make her captive daughter, but Jamie isn't easily killed and turns the tides on Mrs. G. She dies and Rachel escapes the dog cage she was trapped in, allowing her to reunite with her brother. Mrs. G and Jamie are the killers. In the beginning of this movie, I definitely thought that I was going to end up recommending it. It is a low-budget horror film that uses a ton of great practical effects during all the kills. The gore is over the top and hilarious. Pretty much every time a character is killed, they instantly have blood pouring from their mouths, no matter where they are stabbed. I feel like this must have been done for comedic effect, since the mouth blood doesn't even fit with most of the inflicted wounds. Speaking of comedic effect, the first two thirds of the movie are pretty funny. It feels self-aware during most of the scenes leading up to the last act. Unfortunately, as the movie goes on, it gets a lot less funny. It's like they just decided to stop putting in jokes. The dialogue, which isn't ever a strong point, gets really bad and the delivery doesn't help at all. In most bad horror movies, the acting makes the movie funnier, but a lot of the acting in this is just so noticeably bad. A lot of the actors aren't even trying to act at all. The main girl, Rachel, is played by Todd Nunez's sister, Ashley Mary, and she doesn't bring anything to the table. What surprises me is that she won second place for a Best Actress Award at Action on Film International Film Festival for this. There are definitely some low bars in the horror genre, but come on. First place went to Jessica Cameron, who is the first victim in this movie. She was pretty good at least. There are multiple fight scenes that are terribly done. Maybe the director thought the fight scenes would be funny the way they were shot, but they did absolutely nothing for me. I feel like if you're going to have three short fight sequences in your movie, you should definitely put some effort into the choreography. The pacing in the last third of the movie is terrible. I just didn't care about Rachel. Her character isn't really developed at all, so I don't care if she ends up the final girl. There are some other technical mistakes like a lot of shaky camera shots, harsh lighting, and some audio mistakes, but I can look past all of that. My biggest issue with the film is the awful final act. The climax and twist of the film are so bad, mostly because there's just no reason to care about any of the characters or plot in this. 
If you want to see how you are supposed to build tension and do a reveal in a similar vein, go watch Sleepaway Camp. The scenes where Jamie is going around killing randoms is where the movie really shines. You get some truly hilarious and well done moments. There's a funny sequence where you keep waiting to see the murderer's weapon of choice, some good old head shears, disappear from a counter as the camera follows a girl grabbing things from a fridge then placing them on said counter. It ends how you expect with her noticing the missing shears eventually, followed by a great practical effect kill, which I really enjoyed. The first time a guy gets his dick cut off in this movie is hilarious. You just see the snipping action of some head shears and hear a thud on the ground. You then get a shot of the severed penis, but no dicks are shown getting graphically cut off in this movie. There are multiple severed dicks shown, and towards the end of the movie, Jamie does bring Mrs. G a literal bag of dicks, which is hilarious in its own right. Small warning for all you pet lovers, Jamie does kill a dog and cat, but the deaths are off screen and the animal noises used aren't that bad. Even though I hated the last part of this movie, I want to say I soft recommend it for the amazing kills. They are definitely the only reason to give this one a watch. The craftsmanship of the practical effects is amazing. Basically, once you get to the point where Rachel is the only one of her friends that's alive, you can turn it off. Give this a watch if you're looking for some well-executed kills and can look past some terrible acting and ridiculous plot. Number 3, Silent Night, Deadly Night 2, 1987, directed by Lee Harry. Ricky, the original killer, Bobby's brother, is being interviewed in a prison by a psychiatrist. Ricky discusses all the events of the first movie, then reveals some information about his own past kills. He then goes into detail about all the other people he killed and how he got arrested. After this recollection of events, Ricky kills the psychiatrist and escapes the prison. He goes to the mother superior's house and kills her. A detective shows up at the house and shoots Ricky three times. The film ends with Ricky opening his eyes. Ricky is the killer. I knew that this was going to have a bunch of flashbacks in it, but boy oh boy did I not expect the entire first movie to be condensed and put in the beginning of the sequel. You literally get 40 minutes of flashbacks to the original movie, 40 long, agonizing minutes before you get to really see anything new. I can't believe someone gave the go-ahead for the entire first movie to be in the sequel as flashbacks. It isn't enjoyable for me, someone who has watched the first film, and I don't think it would be even enjoyable for people that haven't, since the flashbacks are a terrible representation of the scenes from the first movie. Ricky didn't even witness 99% of the events shown. Also, I'm not sure why they decided to change the Santa that Officer Barnes killed into a janitor instead of a priest. Kind of a strange retcon. I'll just state it here now. If you decide to watch this movie, skip the first 40 minutes. Okay, now that we are past that, the rest of the movie is incredibly enjoyable. The guy who plays Ricky, Eric Freeman, is absolutely hilarious in this. I want to believe that he was completely self-aware because if all of what he did in this was intentionally bad, he is an incredible comedic actor. His line delivery is hysterical, and I really enjoyed the fake laughs he does. The kills in this movie are ridiculous and great when we finally get to them. The effects for them are fun and practical. This would have been a perfect sequel if we just got more time with Ricky instead of flashbacks to the first film. The theater heckler guy, played by Randy Post, that Ricky kills, overacts to an insane degree which is also hilarious. A movie where that guy keeps coming back to life and Ricky has to continue killing him in different locations is all I could ever want. One thing that was a strange choice in this, besides the oodles of flashbacks, is there is a different actor for 15-year-old Ricky that looks just as old, if not older, than Eric Freeman. I'm not sure why they didn't have him play Ricky at 15, since it made much less sense to have the other actor who also doesn't look like a teenager. It was nice to see the Mother Superior finally get what was coming to her, even though it does feel a little bittersweet. I think it would have helped if there were some flashbacks showing the mother superior being awful to Ricky after Billy's death to really cement his hate for her, even though her being the main reason his brother went insane isn't the worst reason for him to want her dead. There is a scene where Ricky picks up a loan shark character 
that looks to be at least over 200 pounds with ease. I really appreciate that Ricky is shown to be ridiculously strong, just like Billy. When Ricky is at the movie theater, the movie he is watching is the first Silent Night, Deadly Night. Ricky goes on a shooting spree after stealing a cop's revolver. I was very surprised that this movie didn't have the gun shoot more than six times. It's a little thing, but I appreciate it. Another small thing I liked was the Mother Superior's house number, which is 666. Excluding the awful 40 minutes of flashbacks, this movie is an incredibly fun time. The gore isn't as crazy, but it isn't really missed since Ricky's performance is all you need in this one. I would say give this one a watch if you've already watched the original on the sole condition that you skip the first 40 minutes. It's a good time. I wouldn't consider it as much of a Christmas movie as the first one, even though it is set on Christmas Eve and Ricky kills the Mother Superior while wearing a Santa suit. Number 4, A Christmas Horror Story, 2015, directed by Grant Harvey, Steve Hoban, and Brett Sullivan. A series of stories are loosely related. Santa's workshop is swarming with infected elves in a delusional man's mind. A kid is replaced by a changeling. Some teens have a run-in with ghost possession. A family of jerks gets what they deserve when Krampus ends up being real. A ghost of a murdered pregnant girl. A mother named Kim. A changeling from a grove. Gerdhart, the caretaker, in Krampus form. Caprice in Krampus form and Norman the Weatherman are the killers. Whoa, that's a lot of killers. Tis the season for murder, I suppose. This is the first anthology to grace the podcast, which is the real reason for the extended list of killers and directors. I thought this movie was going to be hot garbage based on the very little I knew about it before diving in, but I was pleasantly surprised. Goes to show you you shouldn't judge a movie based solely on a terrible cover of a jacked Krampus fighting a Santa Claus. Every story kept my interest. None of them were incredible or groundbreaking, but it's nice to see things like changelings and weird ghost possession. This movie came out the same year as Michael Doherty's Krampus, which caused a lot of confusion at the time, since Trick or Treat was an anthology, like A Christmas Horse Story, and Krampus was not. I actually did a rewatch of Krampus and stand by my opinion of it being bad, even though it does have some good stuff in it. Man, that ending is dookie. Back to a Christmas horse story. William Shatner shows up to play a radio DJ for one of the easiest paychecks in all of acting history. He just sits in a DJ booth and cheesily reads lines. I actually liked his scenes a lot. I might be a sucker for radio DJ scenes though, since I had a brief stint as one. He isn't really part of the overall story, besides being related to one of the families and dropping hints about Norman's psychotic break. There are two atrocities that happen in this movie. For the first one, Kim, the mother of the child, taken by the changeling, brings the changeling back to the grove that her family was trespassing in to steal a Christmas tree where her and her husband originally lost their child due to them not keeping an eye on him. When she gets there, the farmer guy that is trying to contain the changelings tells her he can't get her son back, not even in a mean way, mind you, and she just straight up shoots him dead. She gets her son back for the cost of a man's life and lets loose a gaggle of changelings into the world, which, based on this movie, will end up killing even more people. Way to go, Kim. You just killed someone in cold blood for your own mistakes. The second and much worse atrocity, a terrible douchebag son named Duncan is in his aunt's house. His aunt tells him not to touch her Krampus statue. He then goes to continue touching it, which prompts the caretaker Gerdhart to tell him not to touch it again. So Duncan, the little scumbag jerk, smugly slides the figure off the table it was on, causing it to fall and break into pieces. The worst part about this terrible atrocity is that later in the movie, Duncan gets an off-screen death. Where is the brutal, gory death for one of the most deserving characters to be brought up on this podcast? Come on. First that terrible Luke kid in the last episode gets off easy, and now Duncan? I need my brutal comeuppance kills, which is a hunger horror fans have that can never be fully satiated. I really enjoyed the twist that Norman thought he was Santa killing zombie elves, when in fact he was just randomly murdering people in a mall dressed as Santa. If I have learned anything these past couple weeks, it's to be very afraid of random guys in Santa costumes. You never know when they'll just snap. 
The acting in this is good enough. There isn't a ton of on-screen gore besides the zombie elf scenes, but those parts and the other small bits that are on screen are done well. There was also a cool effect that gave the changelings glowing eyes that I liked a lot. This movie isn't a masterpiece, but it's a good time and captures that Christmas feel. Give it a watch during the holidays next year. Fun fact, Walmart put a slipcover on this movie which changed the name to A Holiday Horror Story. Number 5, White Christmas, 2014, directed by Carl Tibbetts. At a remote outpost somewhere in the snow, two guys get to know each other, which really turns out to be one of the guys, Matt, interrogating the other dude, Joe, using some creepy get-in-your-brain technology. Matt gets a confession after revealing some stories about his past and work experience. Joe then spills the beans about killing his ex's dad, Matt is then let go for his crimes and blocked by the world. A goth girl and Joe are the killers. I know what some of you are thinking. This podcast promises six new movies every week. This is an episode of Black Mirror. You are correct, but it is a feature-length special of Black Mirror, which I feel counts. Strangely enough, it might be one of the scariest things I've watched for the podcast. Technology is spooky stuff. To elaborate on the goth killer... Matt, played by the lovely John Hamm, is basically Hitch, or the pickup artist, for another guy. He can see what the guy sees and tell him what to do in order to help the other guy pick up ladies. He helps the other guy get taken home by a goth girl, played by Natalia Tenya, who played Tonks in Harry Potter and the wildling Asha in Game of Thrones. The goth girl then poisons the dude and herself as a murder-suicide. Matt doesn't alert the authorities, though, which gets him in trouble, leading to him helping the coppers get Joe's confession. A big part of the episode is technology that allows someone to block another person. The way it works is once someone is blocked, both the blocker and blockee appear as gray silhouettes that can't speak to each other. This lasts until the blocker dies, or turns it off. To give some context on how it was used in the episode, Joe had a girlfriend who got pregnant. She told Joe she was going to abort the baby, which caused him to be a real jerk to her, so she blocked him. Joe then finds out she actually had the kid, who the ex also blocked Joe from seeing. The ex eventually dies, which allows Joe to see his daughter, who is in fact not his daughter, since his ex cheated on him with her dude friend. This prompts Joe to kill the ex's dad, who the daughter lived with, when he has kind of a mental breakdown. If the ability to be blocked doesn't sound horrible enough yet, at the end of the episode, Matt is set free, but the police have him blocked by everyone. This means he can't see or communicate with anyone normally. I think death would be better than that. The whole idea of blocking is absolutely terrifying in my opinion. I almost forgot, Joe also gets stuck in the fake remote outpost for thousands of years at the end of the episode. He can't even kill himself. Talk about cruel and unusual punishment. If you've never seen Black Mirror, almost every episode is a depressing take on the dangers of technology. I honestly don't know how I enjoy the series so much when almost every episode ends in an incredibly depressing way. In this particular episode, all the acting is fantastic. This was the first episode to feature a non-British actor in a main role. John Hamm is great as always and plays this manipulative character perfectly. The technology shown in this episode is absolutely terrifying and shown in such a simple way that didn't require a ton of CGI effects. Una Chaplin, Charlie Chaplin's granddaughter, is also in this. She plays a character that gets a small copy of her mind turned into a personal servant slave for herself, which is basically a souped-up Alexa. The quality of the Black Mirror series as a whole is just fascinating. It's amazing. My only gripe about White Christmas is that it doesn't actually instill that good old Christmas feel in me, so I can't recommend it as a holiday watch. Definitely binge all of Black Mirror, including this feature-length special. The fourth season was just released by Netflix. Number 6, Terror Train, 1980, directed by Roger Spottiswood. Alana, played by Jamie Lee Curtis, helps a frat bro named Doc pull a prank on a nerdy pledge named Kenny at a New Year's Eve party. Alana doesn't know that the prank involves an old lady's corpse. Kenny freaks out and ends up in a psychiatric hospital. 
Three years later, the annual frat New Year's Eve party is hosted on a train. People start dying. It's obviously Kenny back for revenge. There is also a magician on board with his assistant. Everyone thinks that the magician is Kenny. Eventually, the real Kenny ends up in a room with Alana and reveals he was actually cross-dressing as the assistant. The train's conductor then busts in and smacks Kenny off the train to his death. Kenny is the killer. Jamie Lee Curtis with another 1980s horror movie. I've already gushed enough about Jamie Lee Curtis, so I'll keep my thoughts on her short. She's amazing in this, and a real central character, like in Prom Night. She's not some terrible side character, like in The Fog. Now for the rest of the movie. Who doesn't love a train murder mystery? That's right, no one. Everyone loves murder mysteries set on trains. The only problem with this particular one is that you, as a viewer, should instantly know who the killer is. The movie does have a red herring with the amazing magician that is on the train. You are supposed to believe that this handsome wizard is Kenny, but I honestly never bought that it was. I was correct. Kenny wasn't the magician that is actually played by David Copperfield. You heard me right. David Copperfield plays a party magician in a 1980s slasher. When I saw his name roll up in the credits, I was shocked. This was Copperfield's first movie, and he was great as the diva magician. So if Kenny wasn't the magician, who was he? Well, I already spoiled it in the summary, but I honestly did not see the twist coming. He was the assistant the whole time? But wait, he kills the guy on the platform in order to steal a Groucho Marx costume, which Kenny uses to get on board. I don't remember the class clown that is killed for the costume as being someone that was responsible for the awful prank pulled on Kenny, so I don't really understand why he would risk killing that guy when he already had an easy way to get around as the magician's assistant. Huh. Anyway, Kenny has multiple costume changes since he steals the costumes off the people he kills. I should mention, this was a costume party on a train for New Year's Eve. It was kind of a cool idea that I wish was used a little more. A movie about a killer at a costume party where the killer could be anyone sounds awesome and has probably already been made. There aren't any super wacky kills in this and the gore is mostly at a minimum. We do get to see a severed finger, hand, and a head, which look good enough for an 80s slasher. Honestly, the most interesting piece of gore was the old lady's corpse. The acting from the rest of the cast is mostly fine. You get to watch a ton of magic tricks since Copperfield basically performs throughout the movie whenever a terrible band isn't playing. Seriously, I hated the random keyboard guy that is in this. The music in this and the sound effects sound like they were pulled directly from Scooby-Doo, which means I love them. The movie references New Year's Eve multiple times, but doesn't have a countdown at either party, unfortunately. I'd still say it's probably the best New Year's Eve horror movie you're going to get at the moment, out of the ones that I've seen. The lead singer of Vanity 6, Denise Katrina Matthews, better known as Vanity, is also in this as one of the girlfriends. You might remember the Vanity 6 hit, Nasty Girl. Terror Train is a fun movie and is worth a watch. There is another movie that came out in 1986 called April Fool's Day, which has a similar plot, but is a lot more comedic that I also recommend. Number 7, Brain Dead, also known as Dead Alive, 1992, directed by Peter Jackson. A strange creature called a rat monkey is taken from Skull Island. A mama's boy named Lionel catches the eye of a girl named Paquita. They go on a date to a zoo where Lionel's mother shows up and gets bit by the rat monkey. The mom ends up turning into basically a zombie and other people end up infected. Lionel tries to keep everything contained by housing the small group of zombies and sedating them. All hell breaks loose when his terrible uncle throws a huge party at the house giving the infection a great opportunity to spread. Lionel kills a ton of zombies and faces off against his mother to save the day. A rat monkey infection and helicopter parenting are the killers. When most people hear the name Peter Jackson, they think of the amazing Lord of the Ring movies. Others might think of those terrible Hobbit movies, which he tried to save after Guillermo del Toro jumped ship. If you think the Hobbit movies were bad because of Peter Jackson, please do some research about the development of those films. Peter Jackson not only made some of the best fantasy films of all time, he also made a bunch of insane movies before that, which include amazing practical effects work and puppetry. 
He made a whole Muppets-esque movie called Meet the Feebles right before Brain Dead. Peter Jackson is one of my favorite directors, and Brain Dead is said to be the goriest movie of all time. It gets that title due to using the most fake blood of any production ever. Obviously, this is one of my favorite movies. Peter Jackson said Buster Keaton was a big inspiration for the film, which makes a lot of sense given the amount of visual comedy in this that is pulled off perfectly by Timothy Baum, who plays Lionel. His movements and mannerisms are almost pulled directly from silent films. He is up there with other modern actors like Brian Cranston and Michael Richards when it comes to being funny solely with movements. Just because silent film was an inspiration for Brain Dead doesn't mean the sound is lacking at all. The sound effects in this movie are overstated throughout in amazing fashion, which makes everything appear even more over the top and cartoonish. Normally having crazy sound effects can hurt a film, but the sound comes together perfectly with the ridiculous imagery of the film. There is such a fascinating amount of creativity in all aspects of Brain Dead. The sheer amount of insane different zombie deaths and practical effects usage blows me away. This film is absolutely disgusting, but in a completely comedic way. It grosses you out and keeps you glued to the screen, wondering what crazy thing is going to pop up and entertain you next. Richard and Tanya Taylor, the founders of Weta Workshop, played a huge role in bringing all the amazing special effects to Braindead and pretty much all of Peter Jackson's films since Meet the Feebles. Honestly, do yourself a favor and watch this whenever you get the chance. If you are normally averse to gore, still give it a chance, since the gore is done in such a way that is absolutely ridiculous and far away from the realm of reality. I don't want to give anything else away. Watch Brain Dead. If you like the Evil Dead series, Brain Dead is basically a turbocharged version. It is a personal dream of mine to someday make a splat stick film like this. Also, quick small warning for you dog fiends. The mom does eat a dog. The actual eating is off camera, and it's pretty hilarious, but I've made a point to warn about cute animal related kills on this podcast, so there you have it. That's a wrap on another delicious episode of Blank is the Killer. I was hoping I could find a super amazing must-watch New Year's Eve movie for all you viewers, but none of the ones I saw were astounding. At least I found some okay ones. As always, a big thanks to Sticker Fridge for hosting this on iTunes. They just put out a new short called Time Slice. It's about a time travel pizza boy. He gets into a rather precarious situation. Give it a watch on their YouTube channel. If you'd like to support the Sticker Fridge Network, head on over to StickerFridge.com whenever you have a hankering for online shopping. On the home page is an Amazon link you can click on that makes a cannon shoot tiny coins at us whenever you buy stuff after clicking it. If you want to support Blank is the Killer, leave a review on iTunes if you're bored on the toilet. If you have anything you'd like to tell me, like criticisms, recommendations, dad jokes, pleads for a guest spot, literally anything, you can leave a comment on the YouTubes, Facebook, or Instagram. Catch the next episode on January 14th. I will fill your ears with gibberish again soon. And remember, it's not Peter Jackson's fault The Hobbit was bad.